The views and opinions expressed do not necessarily reflect those of Access for Wayne, the Allen County Public Library, or any other supporting groups. If you'd like to produce a show, call us at 260-421-1250. Center for Kids, and we are up in Kendallville at the Kendallville Library, and my guest today, tonight, is Dr. Katherine Reddick. Hello. Hello. Welcome. I'm welcome. I'm glad, no, glad I'm here. <laughs> oh. Anyways, she's come to talk about what? I'm here to talk about um, things we can do to improve our foster care system, and what we can do to help the kids from way little to adulthood. So, there you go. She's okay. So that's what we're going to be talking about. I'm going to be talking to you guys because cameras are, you know, I get too nervous and talk to see cameras, so I'm just going to be busy with you guys. Okay, today I, what I, <laughs> what I want to do is I don't want this to be depressing, and I know some things you're going to see are going to be surprising and, and possibly depressing, but we're going to have some laughs along the way because, trust me, we had lots of laughs as well in our childhood and in our adulthood with some of the things that were so abnormal that are actually funny. So, to get started, I call on my, my, my presentation is America's Hidden Children. That's what I call it because that's how it felt uh, growing up in the foster care system and as an adult of uh, being in the foster care system. I feel like the kids are really hidden in our society and we don't really acknowledge their needs until it's too late and a number of our prisoners now have come through the foster care system. So my approach is to take a much more proactive approach with it and help people understand it, but also help create plans to fix it and to help find ways to improve our system. So the picture, this is my siblings and I, don't we look cute? <laughs> we are, uh, wow. With my mother, she dressed us all up. We were to be the Von Trapp family. Uh, we, in public, this was our public image, we went around and we made money um, singing musicals uh, to people. Which and one are you? You can't tell? Pick. Yeah. The one with the smile. The one everyone's grabbing onto. I was the oldest girl. And a lot, now that I'm a psychologist, I can see there's a lot more meaning in this picture I I than I ever Sorry. did before. Yeah. yeah. Now, I don't even know where I got this picture. We have no family photos. So somebody sent me this, and I don't even know where it came from, but I was really excited to get it because it just showed me so much. And this is my oldest brother, Jim, and uh, my brother, Pat. He's the one that also helped me write the obituary. We kind of decided to do it. Uh, this is Martha, and this is Marianne. And this happened to be an event where we were singing Christmas carols. Now, she always, she liked to dress us up, but if we were um, at the children's home where we grew up and we did not arrive to her looking like that, she would start the abuse because it was our fault we didn't dress in whatever it was she bought us. But to move on, life with our mother, this is the tough part, so I'll get through this and then we'll, we'll go to something a little more cheerful. My mother had a lot of mental health issues. She was hospitalized multiple times and the state kept giving us back to her. Um, that doesn't happen as much nowadays, uh, but they don't put people in mental health institutions anymore. Now they just give them medications and keep them reuniting re with their family. That was a big issue for us. We were My first foster home was six weeks old, and it never stopped until I turned seven, and then they finally took us away permanently, and then that's where I stayed until I was 18. Okay, so um, there were a lot of symptoms along the way, a lot of clues where people could have helped us and didn't either, were fearful. There were some people that did stand up to our mother when they saw, when they saw her hurting us and, and abusing us in public. 
But um, a lot of people were just as, she would just be as vicious with them as she was with us. I mean, she would really go at it with them. So emergency room visits were very common in our family. The siblings um, would, we'd often end up, one of us would end up at the emergency room. And unfortunately, back then, it was the 60s and 70s, it was more about the parents having absolute power and absolute control. And whatever they said happened, it happened. There was no question about it. So um, lots of times our mother would leave us, and I'm going to go back to that picture because this really wasn't true. Oh, where is it? Oh, there's a pointer. Cool. <laughs> okay, where's that picture? I want to go back. Try the left and right. Is there a right? No, it's just a. Okay, well, I'll just go back. But you guys saw the picture. At that age, we were actually left alone a lot of the time. Um, our mother, our father was very seldom ever there. When he was there, it was just as violent because he was violent and an alcoholic. So when he was gone, it was good times. But as long as our mother was happy, um, our mother ran a house of prostitution and she would, if things were going well, she would be happy. If she hung up that phone and she didn't get a client, it was our fault. And at night, she would um, put us in the kitchen and that's where we'd have to stay. We'd have to be in this little kitchen. It had to be absolutely quiet. She would drug the little kids. We were, well, we were all little, but I saw myself as being big in that picture. Um, give us medications and stuff to keep us to sleep at night so we wouldn't wake up anybody. And then if we needed to go to the restroom, we weren't allowed out of the kitchen. There was a doggy door that we had to go out. And if we got hungry, there was dog food under the counter, dry dog food that we could eat if we really needed something. So. That was, that was just some of the stuff. But um, then we get, when, when she was gone, and she'd often take off on adventures for um, men. She was, she was a very attractive woman. And so men would take her places. They'd take her on weekend visits, or she'd go to Hawaii for a week. And she would leave us, those kids that were right there, she would leave us alone. And we would fend for ourselves. So one of the things we did, of course, we didn't go to school at the time when, when she was gone. Um, my we'd take our wagon, we had a little wagon, we'd pull it around the neighborhood, and we'd steal things from people. We'd steal Coke bottles, mainly Coke bottles, out of their garage doors, because back then, that was a big thing. That people collected their Coke bottles, and they always left them stacked outside their garage, and we'd just walk around the neighborhood, and, oh, look, there's some, and we'd go get them. And uh, we'd do the same thing with um, fields, and this was about the time we lived in Las Vegas. And we'd switch shoes, we didn't always have a lot of shoes, Except for the outside package that she showed us that she wanted the public to see, those were our clothes. And anything else we had to share or whatever we could come up with. Um, but we'd take the Coke bottles and we'd collect them and we'd go to the grocery store with them. And my oldest brother and I, we were, my brother, oldest brothers were the men of the house, and the house, men of the house, and I was the mother of the house. So it was my job to take care of all the little girls, little siblings, and we had eight of us all together. So what we did, uh, we bought puffed wheat cereal and, and dried not that milk for feeding the older kids. Uh, for once in a while, we got brave. We'd make mashed potatoes. We'd, we'd know how to do that. But for the babies, it was always carol syrup, canned milk, and water. Um, that's what we, we made the baby bottles with that. And we did all the changing of diapers. And God only knows. I mean, you saw how young we were. What a bad job. I mean, I must have been a horrible mother. <laughs> but, but, you know, I mean, you do the best you can. But we did have some good experiences with it. We often had more fun when my mother was not there than when she was there. And uh, we took better care of each other when she was not there. So I think there's some good some things that um, we have some good memories of how we cared and nurtured for each other. But we also have some where she was so... Um, awful to sim she started a lot of sibling sibling rivalry because she was mentally ill and she did not want us to love anyone but her and that was really tough because I think the sibling to sibling abuse was the most painful memory I have because and I don't know if it's because I was the oldest girl and supposed to protect my siblings but when she'd get in her tangents she would really um, encourage physical abuse between my siblings and I or my brother's brother against brother. And that has lasted a lifetime. Uh, and that's the sad part about this, is that those sweet little siblings that I have there, we very seldom, I have one brother that I see, and the rest of us are all spread out. And I haven't seen my oldest brother for 
uh, probably 40, 50 years. And um, my sister, one of my sisters there, I saw her after the obituary came out. Well, I haven't seen her yet. I, um, she, she got me on Facebook, and so she contacted me about Christmas time this year. And I haven't seen her since I was probably 22, 30, some years ago. So that's a pretty long time not to be able to have your family around. So anyway, that was what our life was like with our mother. And as you can see, there's a lot there that have to change in our society. We went, if I started a foster home when I was six weeks old, and I kept going back and forth because that's what they would do. They would put us back and forth. And we would run away. And so my mother taught us to quote the Fifth Amendment when the police would come get us. We would run away. And um, it was my brother's and my job to get the kids. They used to put us all in the same place. And so it was our job to get the kids out the bathroom window in the middle of the night, and then we would walk home or hitchhike home, and then she'd skip the state, with she'd have everything packed up, ready to go in the car if she was home, and we'd go to a different place, a different county or whatever, and so this, they never kept track of us. And so that's how she played the game with them. And then when the state finally took us away, she got visitation, and then she took us to Nevada. That was from California to Nevada. So finally, they did take us. Let's see. Oh, this thing just didn't work, and that's why. All right, I'll just use this. Oh, expired. What's expired? Oh, that's, that's something totally different. Let me see this. How we've done. I'm sorry. This is a shocking one. This is this is really what these kids experience. I know it's a terrible picture, but this is part of the abuse. You don't know, and you just and if you see the eyes in that child, you don't understand. They don't. That child doesn't understand why they're feeling that way, and that's what's so sad about allowing it to happen and continue to happen. And then, as you get older and you start figuring out the system, you go through this phase where you're just. Every, you're, just, you're so full of shame that you don't want to be around other people. And even if you are, some of the people are so mean, they make fun of you because you're in that situation. So, um, whoops, that one went back. Now that one goes forward. There we go. And there's a lot of love that we experienced as siblings. And it breaks my heart today to know that we didn't get to share the normal sibling um, things that, that normal kids would get to. But every once in a while, we have some great experiences like that. Um, I just wish it was more often. And sometimes in the system, you see things like that too. But, and, but pets are a great way, to, um, you know, as we talk of resolutions and, and ways to empower kids, pets are perfect for, for children who are being abused and neglected uh, because they just bring so, such unconditional love. So that's, that's something that I hope we can achieve. One of the sad things is after we were all taken away from into the social care system, uh, our 16-month-old brother was beat to death in his foster home. And that was, when I looked back at the records on his death, it was very obvious. Today they would have caught that and said these people did this. I mean, the, the autopsy was very, very clear about it. But the problem was the social workers didn't listen to the kids who had previously been in that foster home. The neighbors had complained several times. There were several complaints from the neighbors about the way the kids were being treated. And there were several reports from the foster kids to their social workers that this was abusive home. So what they did is they took all the older kids out of this home and put in younger children, which was the worst thing possible because now you've got a the 16-month-old baby and my youngest sister was with this one and she was less than three. So there was no way to get these kids help. And so um, one of them ended up dying. So then we went to the foster care system into another place. That was from Las Vegas. They sent us into a, a children's home, which was with 70 other kids. So. The idea of the children's home was that it set up in cottages, 10 kids per each cottage. Boys were in cottages and girls were in cottages. 
the problem with it, even, even though it's a good idea because they need that, because there are so many kids that need these services, and most people don't become foster parents or don't know how to do it, or if they do become a foster parent, they don't know how to manage the kids, they don't understand the needs of the kids, and there's nobody to help them. So that's one area that I'm really passionate about is, okay, once we get them in the system, we get them taken away from those parents, we've got to find a system and create a system that is functional for the kids and helps them heal and, and be better. So um, we were living in a good foster home at the time of my brother's death and my, my three sisters and I were together. We weren't going to run away from that place at all. They were awesome to us. They were so good. We had, I'll never forget, that's, um, we had chicken pot pie dinners every Saturday night. We drove us into Las Vegas. We came from Boulder City down to Las Vegas. And I remember sitting in the back of that seat just loving those lights and looking at how much fun it was. And we'd still get in trouble. We still stole. We still cussed like truck drivers. I mean, yeah, that's the way we were. I mean, if we got in trouble, we quoted the Fifth Amendment. Our mother taught us. I refused to answer on the grounds of might incriminate myself. I mean, can you imagine those little kids at that point doing stuff like that? But that's what we did. But going to get an ice cream cone was like the biggest treat of my life. We, just those little things were so exciting. So the saddest part, the saddest day I remember as a child was actually when they came to tell us that our brother had died. I didn't understand what that meant. And so I didn't really mourn for him. But they came the next day to take us away from that great foster home. And that was the worst day I ever remember. It was just devastating to leave there. And we, it affected us for a long, long time. I still, got, I still get emotional about that. It's, it's just that was, that was, for me, that was the safe place. Um, okay, and then, so what they could have done, let's say they get us in this, this children's home type atmosphere where there's lots of kids. Had there been any of these things, there was, well, these, these were the negative things that were going on. There was a lot of physical abuse, a lot of sexual abuse, lots and lots of emotional abuse in all of them. My, well, you get one or two cottage parents that were good. The problem with the way they were running the system then, so I'm not saying, I'm not an advocate for the way they ran the system. I like children's home philosophy, but I think they missed the, the boat there when they didn't put in good people. They picked anybody who would apply and they didn't screen properly, and they weren't educated. They didn't, there were no qualifications, all that, because they paid for your room and board, the parents. The cottage parents came in, they had two nights a week, two days a week off, but they lived there, all room and board. They had their own room. They had, not that it was a luxurious place, but still, they had their hands on kids that needed love and nurturing, and they could care less whether these kids got love or nurturing. In fact, they were just horribly abusive. So, and they did create a prison-like environment with this type of system also, which is another thing that really made it dysfunctional and hard to live once you stepped out of there. When I turned 18, I had no idea what I was going to do. There was a commissary on the grounds, and the commissary is where we got our food. Um, we didn't go in, just the cottage parents went in it. Um, there was, I worked the whole time, I was from 16 all the way to 18, and I kept giving my cottage parents my money for savings because I had opened a bank account, and they said they would take it in there. I paid my way through, I was in active in school, some activities, so I knew that there was going to be some money going to that. But on the day I left the children's home, with 18, uh, I had $17 in my savings account and two boxes with everything I owned in it. That's no way you can expect someone to be successful in life. So those are some, I know this is hard, but you know these are some of the areas that I see that we can fix. These are all fixable. It's not that it has to be this way. So they did create quite a prison-like environment. We woke up at a certain time, we went to bed at a certain time, we all had, um, it was very, very rigid. You had your place in the shower, your time to take a shower, your day to do your laundry, your time to do your laundry, um, your time to eat breakfast, time to eat lunch. Everything was very, very structured, very much like a prison environment. And when I was doing some research back in the 90s where I was trying to work with this, trying to help the states to fix these things, um, I did some research and 70% of the men in prison had been in the foster care system 
I was shocked by that. But then I went back to memories, and I'm going, no, I'm not really not shocked by that, because this whole style of living sets you up perfectly to fit in and be very comfortable in that setting. So <clears throat> on the weekends, this is another issue that I really, really struggle with today, and our, it hasn't changed much. These parents who abuse their kids still get visitation rights. And that, to me, is the most criminal thing that we can do to these kids and, and to the foster parents that care and provide care for them. Because what happens to these kids on those weekend visits puts them back years. And it's not just what's on the weekends, it's what it's leading up to it. I remember we visited every other weekend. That whole week before I went, I was just a wreck. I couldn't do anything right. I just I was just so stressed about going to visit, and the closer it came, the more stress I got. By the time that weekend visit ended, I was physically and emotionally drained. All of us were. So when we went back to the children's home, this is after being beat up and um, hit all weekend and sitting on the streets waiting for our mother to gamble. She'd be in the casinos gambling, and she'd be pulling those big slot machines, and we'd have to sit down on the curb and wait for her. And then if she won, that was good. But how many times do you win? You know, so it was real bad news if she if she lost. And they didn't even go check to see where we were staying, which totally shocks me today. We stayed at her. She ran an escort service by then. It was in Reno, Nevada, and she called it Ace Escorts. They didn't, and they knew it, and they still let us go there. It was an office above a bar. There's a bar downstairs, and that's where we spent our weekends. And uh, so it was devastating. By the time we got back, we were exhausted. We were up all night long. Every night we spent with her. We were listening to her rages all day. So it took me till about Wednesday or Thursday to get back under control and start not focused on everything that happened that weekend. You sit in school and it's really hard. I get it. I'm a principal now, but I get why these kids cannot focus. I get why they can't do their homework and why, you know, so it, it's really, it's, people don't understand sometimes all the other dynamics that are going on. So I really think we have to fix that so that these parents don't get these kids on the weekends to destroy the progress that foster homes and, and other people that have been working with them are making. Now I understand that some parents are doing better and I, that they're really going to try. And I'm not talking about those parents. I'm talking about the parents who have years in the system, years these kids are having to live this, and it shouldn't be that way. Um, we saw, since there were, we were there so long, and all the other kids, when they came to the children's home, you'd see them walking across. There's a big old playground out there. And you'd see them walking across with their black garbage bags, everything they owned in that black garbage bag. Mm -hmm. And they were coming, and they were scared, and we just saw, here comes another one. And they'd tell us, well, we're not staying long. We're only going to be here for a couple of weeks. And then we all knew, oh, you're here. You're going to be here until you're 18. And we'd make fun of them. We were mean because that was how we survived. So it was really, we didn't, we didn't end up helping many. Um, it, was, it was a cruel system. And we learned to be cruel to survive in it. Um, very little, now, when I was a, a little girl, when I was the third grade is when I went to the children's home. And I was really fortunate that I was um, visiting with, I made some good friends. My girlfriends, their families were so good to me. And they would invite me over for dinner. And I would just, I mean, I loved it. I loved to go spend the night at people's houses. And that was the only sight of reality of what I would see was normal. Unfortunately, my mother would get a hold of these people, find out who they were, and call them all hours of the night, cussing them out, paint their, spray paint their house, put sugar in their gas tanks, um, call them all, just write horrible stories about them in the newspaper, and you know, it's just one nightmare after another. So eventually, people either quit allowing you to come to their house, or they just give up and you, you just lose. So you lose every way. Um, at night, this is the saddest part too. Besides leaving my foster home, this, is, this was a really hard time for me. Um, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my life to keep. 
because I didn't want to live. I wanted to die every night when I went to bed. I never cried during the day, but at night when it was quiet, it was like, oh, I just, please, God, don't let me wake up. I don't want to, I don't want to wake up. And I used to pray to a, um, my own little saint, who I, who I named Melissa, and I always prayed to her that she would save me. And, you know, here I am. I got saved. I ended up saving myself. But, you know, those are the, those are, you know, that's the way it was. Life in the foster care system is incredibly, incredibly difficult. It is not a healing system, and I think there are so many things that we can do to fix it. Now, some of the good stuff, I know you guys are getting real heavy, and I'm getting real heavy, so let me tell you some of the fun things we did. The kids, now I said we were cruel, but we were also so good to each other. When, when it came to someone's birthday, they never celebrated our birthday, but the kids, Oh yeah, we would celebrate. We'd wait for the adults to go to sleep. And we'd be packaging up everything we had. And we'd find, like, if someone gave us something at Christmas time and the other person liked it, it could be a used perfume. We didn't care. We'd wrap it up in something. We'd wrap it up in fabric. We'd wrap it up, whatever it was. And we'd have our own little party. And we'd sit there and giggle in the closet. We'd all be in the closet just giggling away because that was the time that we could feel safe to reach out to each other and care about each other. And on Christmas and on holidays, anything that, you know, we really did start to get close and you do start to love your, the kids that are around you, you start to love them like they are your siblings. And by the time you leave there, you spend all those years with them, they are your siblings. And so you, you're very, um, you become very close with them. We do each other's hair and we stand there at Christmas time, it's so great, the Herald's Club casino they would always do this great Christmas party for us and whole all 70 kids would meet in this big room and the Herald's Club employees every year bought every child in there at least three presents did I say three three <laughs> three presents and it was so special because it was from people we didn't even know we didn't even meet them but yet they reached out to us, and we hung on to those presents for dear life, though. And those presents were, we, we were the queen and kings of repackaging Christmas gifts, because those would last us all year long, and we'd share them with everybody. And the music, we always loved music. Unfortunately, our foster parents didn't like music, so they would never let us play music. And so when we got that, um, we got our two days off, we called, um, she was, Mrs. Miller was her name. And she'd come as a substitute to when they were gone. She was the sweetest lady. She had the voice of a man. She was big. And she was just so kind, though. And so when she'd jump in the shower, because we had this big old long hallway, and she'd jump in the shower, which was their bathroom was right outside the hallway, so we could hear her. And at 10 o'clock, she came. And we'd all run and see her and go visit with her and give her hugs because we knew we were have two days of peace. It was going to be so nice with her there. And she'd go, okay, girls, I'll go to bed. And so we would, okay, okay. But we were all so excited that she was there that we would uh, just try and stay up a little bit longer with her. So she'd go take a shower, and we'd hear the water going, and then we'd go raid the refrigerator. We never would get to do that when, when our other cottage parents weren't there. But we'd be in the kitchen, and we'd raid, some of us would be raiding, like, oh, there's peaches today, or oh, there's this, or oh, there's cereal, let's get this. There, if there were ever cookies, that was like, we'd take that too, whatever we could find. And then some of us would make traps for coming back down the hall, because you got to get there before she gets out of the shower so she wouldn't find us. So we'd make all these traps. We'd put curlers out there in the hallway, and... and hair dryers or just stuff that as soon as they knew we were going to come running down the hallway, we'd be tripping on and giggling. And then Miss Miller would always say, girls, what's going on out there? And we'd all be going, nothing, nothing, you know, and she'd come and check on us a little bit later and we'd all pretend to be asleep in bed, but she knew, but she let us because she knew that the cottage parents we had were so military-like that that was really the only fun we had was when she was there. And if it was our birthday and she was there, she made a cake. And that was so special. She was really, really a great woman. So there's a lot of things that we can do to improve it. There are some great people out there. There's just not enough of them doing it. And so <clears throat> anything I can do to help change that would be something I really focus on. Okay, life after foster care. This is what it feels like. If you can imagine this little guy going out, being just left out there, 
to fend for himself without any skills, without anyone to help if he runs into trouble. That is what it feels like. And I didn't realize it when I was leaving the system. I thought, great, we counted down the days when it was turned 18. It was like that was our day release. We were out of prison. And so we didn't think about it that way. Like, when I left with my two boxes, I didn't have, I only had $17 in my savings account, but you know what? It was like, I didn't care. I was out of here. That's all I always counted the days. I was gone. So, but actually, that's my little boy now. But he's, he's much bigger than that now. But we were up in Denver. But I think that really was what it felt like, if, if I could say that, you know, you're just out there and there's no one when you make a mistake when you don't have money to pay your bills, when you um, get in a relationship that's a bad relationship, and you will because you don't know any better. I was always looking for my savior. Somebody was going to save me from this mess, but it didn't work out that way. So there's a lot of things that we can do to help get these kids prepared for out life outside of the foster care system. It has to come from people though, like you and people like me who now want to go back and say, what can we do to fix this? These kids need, by the time they're 18, they need to be completely independent. They have to have job skills where they can go out there and make a living. So we need community people who will say, okay, I, I lay carpet. Great. Let's teach these kids how to lay carpet. Plumbing. Plumbing. They can make a living at this stuff. Uh, they don't have to always go to college, computer, technology skills. There's stuff that they can do. There's artwork. There's, um, you guys know, dance and arts that the kids do. They're so talented. We just have to give them the opportunity to find out what it is they're talented at and let them explore it. That's the one thing that I can say I never dreamt about when I was a kid. What are you going to do? They don't have dreams. And now, you know, with my kids, oh man, you dream, you dream big, and I'm going to help you get there, but you have to work hard for it. But we didn't have the opportunity to dream big. Our dream was getting by that day, waking up the next morning, or not hoping not to wake up the next morning even. But you know, that's that's. But these people, the faces of hope, are from you and everybody. Because when I was a little girl, I swear I looked at every adult as how my mom, is that my dad, who's coming back to save me. Nobody ever came, and I understand it now, but I didn't when I was little. I didn't understand why I had to live that way, and why nobody would save me. Okay, here it is. We need you. We have to change the way the system works. It has not improved a whole lot over the last 50 years. It really hasn't. I know there have been changes. We've changed some laws that um, help terminate parental rights a little bit sooner, but Again, it's not soon enough. Years and years go by, and these kids are still victimized by, by home visits. Uh, good, caring homes give up, their, give up these kids, not because the kids are bad, but because they can't tolerate the system bringing those kids to them and taking them away and bringing them back harmed, and, and all their work, all their hard labor goes down for nothing because it's, it's just running backwards and the kids are struggling to survive in it. So this is what I want to see for our foster kids. I want to see happy faces. I want to see happy families. They don't have to be in the pain that we that so many of them are in right now. And this is a big one for me. Like I said, we need to dream for a future. That was the, if we can bring one thing to these kids they are never going to succeed if they only if they don't have any hope. If their hope is gone, and it's just learned helplessness, and that's really what it's about. It's about taking away that hopeless feeling and giving them something to hang on to. And when I talk about America's hidden children, this is what I'm talking about. We. These people didn't sacrifice just for the rich kids. They didn't sacrifice just for the good families, the ones that can nurture and care for their kids. But yet, 400,000 kids are sitting in foster homes right now in our society. And that was the data from Human Health and Human Services in 2006. How many years is it since then? So you and I both know between drugs and mental health and alcoholism in our country all going up, 
that number's gone up, I guarantee it. So we have 400,000 hidden children, and I call them hidden because we don't talk about it. We don't explore it. We don't help them. They, don't, they can't help themselves. They're not voting, so the politicians don't care. They say they care, but they don't do anything. They sit there in their white-collar world fighting over silly stuff. You know, we're at war, and we're at war with how do we help our children. To me, that should be the war we should be fighting. Oh, and every time I see the Pledge of Allegiance, and because I'm a school principal, I say it every day, I always, I want with liberty and justice for all. And I always think about that's what we want. We want that for these kids. We have to find liberty and justice for them, too. And if you ever want to contact me, there's my email address. And I hope to find uh, that our society starts taking on a real serious project with these kids and, and really takes this to heart. And it's only going to come with small groups like us taking a small piece. It's way too big of a, it's a huge issue. It's way too big for any one individually to do it. So I'm trying to go around to communities and just start something. Start just, what do you know? Who do you know? Do you know a, um, a judge? Do you know an entrepreneur of some kind? Can you, um, we've got to start grouping together as teams and working on separate, different systems. Do I have more, am I more passionate about what to do to get kids out of the home that's being abused? Am I most, most passionate and do I have the most resources to help kids who are in foster care system? How do we improve that system? Or do I have the most resources and the most knowledge about helping kids prepare for the adult world once they become 18? So I guess it's just about a brainstorming session for you to, to really go home and think about what am I going to do? Because we see it all the time on the news where a child is killed and we just, it hits the news big time for about a week. And then when I get, when I get the word that, oh yeah, well, that parent got two years in prison. Really? That to me doesn't seem like it's justice for all. So that's where I'm at and that's where I'm going to go around the country as much as I can and try to get justice for our kids. So thank you for coming. I appreciate you guys coming and I'm here to answer any questions that you have. PhD. I just got it. <laughs> Took a long time, but it's there. So thank you so much. That was fascinating. I have a, a number of questions. Absolutely. Um, the first one is why were you taken out of that excellent foster home when your brother died? What was their thinking? My mother demanded it. Uh, she knew they killed him, and they didn't want it in the news, they didn't want it uh, public at all. And so she, they you know, she got what she wanted. So you and were you were at a different home though. Mm-hmm. But so your mom. Was she in wanted home. us all. She lived in Reno. Her business was in Reno. We were in Boulder City, which is the opposite end of the state. She didn't have control of the girls anymore. She, my brothers lived in this children's home, but she wanted all of us up there, so she had absolute control over all she of us. Right. Yeah. No, not close. <laughs> Just yeah. wanted control over us. Yeah. I mean, I, I just think that when I wrote up the little story that you got the paper saying that you were coming here, and I was made like, oh, how did she get her doctorate with that kind of a background? Um, could you just very briefly say how you got from Absolutely. $17 to your day? You know, <laughs> That's a great question, and I'd love to share that with you. Um, it's, it's been a long, long road. I went back to the children's home when I was an adult, and... Um, I wanted to run it. I knew that the, that the superintendent was leaving, and I knew if I had my hands on that place, I could make it special. Well, they told me I didn't have a degree, so I couldn't do it. So I said, well, what kind of degree do I need? And so they said, um, well, just go get a degree, a bachelor degree. So I said, okay. So I went back to him. I said, okay, I'm going to do human development and family studies. Will that do it? Oh, yeah, that sounds like a good degree. We, we could do it with that. So I go back and get it. And... I go, and they said, well, sorry, we're closing the children's home down. We're not, we don't, can't do that anymore. So then I decided, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to create my own children's home. And so I, I started a nonprofit um, home called the Reddick Children's Academy. 
and I designed it and um, it was all about educating kids, giving them lots of love and mental health, mental health support, educational services, and spiritual services so that they would become a well-rounded child. And at that point, and this is my long-term goal still, is to, it takes about four years to get a child from, that's been abused like this to be healed enough to where they can go into a home and be successful and function. So I think our system of just throwing them out there for other people is not, not successful. We have to help them, give them the services they need, shape them and help them mold them to, so they can be successful in the family. So then I went to get that funded, got all, my, got all the paperwork done, but it was 503, 5013C Corporation, and they said, well, you don't have enough degrees when I went to get it funded. They said, we love the idea. We love that you went through this. We love that you have a keen insight into this whole issue. But don't you have a master's degree or don't you have extra certification? No, but none of that either. So a couple, few years went by, and I struggled a little bit more, and I was really getting to be help, feeling a little bit learned helplessness again on that one. It was like, is this hopeless? Are they never going to let me do this? So I went and got all kinds of financial aid and started in with my master's. And I went into education. I figured, okay, I had my bachelor's, so I went into public education, went another year to go get my certification there. Thought, I'll work with kids in education. And that worked out well, but it wasn't quite enough for me. So I kept going. Then I went to my master's in education, and then that wasn't enough for me. So I went to industrial organizational psychology because then it gave me the mental health background I would need to also be successful with this. So that's, I just finished it, and now I am a superintendent, a certified superintendent. I have a PhD, and there's no other degree that's higher than what I have. I have, there's no one that can say now you don't have a certification. There's no one that can say I don't have the education. I've got everything I absolutely, the highest I can get. But I've got a lot of college debt. <laughs> I got a house payment, uh -huh, a mortgage. If I had a house, it would be with college debt. But to me, it's worth it. I know in the long run I'm doing what I should be doing. Would you have the academy now? No, because I didn't have the funding for it. So that, But I still have the plan. You still have the plan? Oh, yeah. It's here, and it's still in paper. It's just restarting it and getting people to really believe in it. And that's where I think this time I believed in it, but nobody else did. So this time I want other people to believe in it and other people to really want this. To, it's going to take more than me to fix this system. Any questions for me? Guys? More familiar with the foster care system. <clears throat> I think the biggest problem is government. Mm -hmm. Yes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. They are the epitome of government. Yes. And it's, and you know, it's I, I think the, the foster care system really should be, I don't know, if, uh, for a better word, privatized, possibly, get away from the government. In charge you know, of hospitals or something like that. I, there's lots of, there's, yeah, I, I tend to agree with you. I think the government has messed it up so badly and they throw darts at it without really looking at the whole child as a whole system. They, they, they don't look at their whole system, they don't look at a child's needs, their whole developmental needs, they just go patchwork here, patchwork there, and that's not the way you raise, raise a child. You would never raise your child like that. And so, you know, and, and when you look at the, um, and this isn't to criticize them, because they're doing the best they can. I don't think our government has provided the resources for them to do a really quality job, to hire quality people, and then to really support the kids the way they need it. Just throwing them in a foster home and putting, oh, this always gets me, help wanted ads, we need foster care, we need foster homes, it's under the help wanted section. Really, is that what we want? They're really not adequately reimbursed. For, They're not. Um, do you think that that would make a big difference if there was more um, reimbursement? You know, I have back and forth on that one yeah. because some of the people that do it do it just for the money. And they're low educated. They can bring in six kids in their house. They can fit six kids in their house. They're making more money with those six kids than they would ever have in any job. And that, to me, is the, the sad part about it. So I don't think it's money as much as it is 
um, yeah, I think we could help families more. I think we could provide more for them. But I think we have to find more educated parents to being foster parents and more caring, and I don't care if they're educated, as long as they promote education for the kids and they, they, can, they can build the children up rather than use them to support their own families. Sorry, yes. You're not a victim, you're a survivor. Yes. Oh, and th which brings up a good point. Everybody in my family has always called me Kathy, and I changed it to Catherine. Now everyone calls me Catherine, and I changed that because I always felt somewhere around 40 I had enough. I was like, I'm not going to be a victim anymore. I'm going to that name Catherine. It's stronger, and that's Catherine. That's me. And I started changing how I thought about myself, and I want, didn't want to be a victim anymore. I didn't want to blame anybody else for what I had mistakes I made or the way I didn't have control of things, or my focus was Catherine was going to be a strong woman. and So that, that sounds weird, I know. But if the word victim means that you're still under something. Mm -hmm. Under someone else's control. control. Yeah, good. That's cool. Yeah. So, and if you guys will leave me your name and email address, please, um, I will keep in touch with you, and we can email back and forth on ideas, or you said you were in the foster care system, or you, yeah. So you know what I'm talking about when I saw, when you see these things, and it, it's lifelong, isn't it? It's not something that you just wake up one day and say, wow, it's over, you know. I'm surprised in the 30 or 40 years since you've been in a position where you're still not doing the job. Isn't it? It still does Yeah. And it breaks my heart, and I'm sure it does your too, because my poor siblings now, I mean, you know, lots of mental health issues. One has died from alcoholism, um, and some of my, two of them I don't even see. One of them has tried to commit suicide more times than, you know, she's come close many times. But it's, it's a lifetime that of self-doubt and self-hatred that you have to overcome. Where people in foster homes were they almost like property instead of children? Oh, I think that's a good point. I would say, yeah. What would you think? Property rather than children? So I, I think so. I think so. Yeah. Now I think the foster home. You know, when I did have that really great foster home, I did go back when I was probably oh, um, maybe 15 years ago. He had already died, but she was still alive, and I went to this home. And I'm telling you, it was so funny, because I thought this was the biggest house in the whole world. And I went back as an adult, and this house was so tiny. <laughs> and it was, but it was just the same way, and she was just such a tiny, sweet woman. And she took me for an ice cream cone. I couldn't believe it. I was like, she goes, well, you guys used to love it when we take it for ice cream cone. And I'd say, all right, let's go. <laughs> nice lady and we were able to I was able to thank her for that one great year of my life and I think most kids would do that too well if you'll leave me your information I will promise to keep in touch with you and you know if you have any way that you guys can come up with ideas to help um, we've got to start working together to fix it and we're going to build teams where are you as I'm not a superintendent. Right. I'm only certified You're superintendent. A I'm a principal in Odessa, Texas right okay. now. Yeah. Texas. Okay. Yeah. But I'm looking for a job somewhere else because I don't like Odessa, Texas. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it's, I did my research there. It was a great place to do research. It's a very low socioeconomic area, and that was one of what my research was on, is how to improve education for low SES kids. And so that was a great opportunity, so I appreciate the opportunity they gave me. But now I'm ready to move to a nice, safe, quiet neighborhood. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am.